Good morning. I'd like to call the uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming to order um, and wanted to uh, let our witnesses and everyone know that we are having some difficulty with timekeeping because the clocks are not working appropriately, but we'll give you an indication uh, when you begin to speak uh, what the timing will be. I think most of you know what that procedure is like. Um, unfortunately, this morning, uh, Chairman Markey uh, is not able to be with us. Uh, he had a little slight uh, wrinkle. <laughs> He's getting it taken care of, and I don't mean it, <laughs> I don't mean it uh, facially or figuratively speaking, <laughs> um, he, he uh, broke his wrist, so uh, we hope that he will have a speedy recovery and come back to us very soon. But I'm very delighted that this particular hearing is going to focus on healthy planets, healthy people, global warming, and public health, something that some of us here on the committee have been talking about for some time. And it just happens that this week is both National Public Health Week and World Health Day. And so we're focusing on the impact of climate change that we'll have on our communities and the health and well-being of our communities. Today's hearing is an opportunity to address this important relationship. The World Health Organization reported that the effects of climate change may have caused over 150,000 deaths in the year 2000 and predicts that these impacts are likely to increase in the future. According to the IPCC, the United States will be challenged by increased heat waves, air pollution, forest fires during the course of the century with potential risks for adverse health impacts such as heat stress, increases in asthma, allergies, chronic and obstructive pulmonary disease. Last October, the director of the United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Julie Gerberg, Birding uh, testified that climate change is anticipated to have a broad range of impacts on the health of Americans and the nation's public health infrastructure. The World Health Organization found that the negative public health impacts of climate change will disproportionately impact communities that are already vulnerable. Children, the elderly, poor, and communities of color, as we know, are most vulnerable to the negative health impacts of climate change. More than 50% of 30 million people in the U.S. are impoverished and they currently live in urban areas. The majority of these communities are of color. And it, recent report issued by the IPCC noted that these communities will have less capacity to deal with effects of climate change. Many of those communities are already suffering cumulative exposures. For example, 5.5 million Latinos and 68 percent of all African Americans live within the range where health impacts from power plants are the most severe, and more than 70 percent of African Americans and Latinos live in counties that violate <coughs> federal air pollution standards. The EPA first recognized the possible impacts of climate change on public health over a decade ago. And in 1997, EPA's publication titled Climate Change and Public Health, the EPA wrote that as climate changes, natural systems will be destabilized, which could pose a number of risks to human health. And in 2001, the EPA sponsored a report for the Global Change Research Program entitled Climate Change and Human Health the potential consequences of climate variability and change. The report stated that the assessment makes clear that the potential health impacts are diverse and demand improved health infrastructure and enhanced targeted research. As policymakers, we have a moral imperative to make sure that policy and regulations protect our most vulnerable populations. Unfortunately, the health and welfare of minority and low-income communities continues to be put at risk by the administration's failure to develop and implement and enforce environmental regulations, including the regulation of greenhouse gases. The administration is doing more than a disservice by not acknowledging that greenhouse gas emissions cause or contribute to air pollution, which may endanger public health. It is unnecessarily risking public health. Hurricane Katrina demonstrated to the world the direct effects that climate change is having on the health of our most vulnerable populations. These outcomes, as we know, will worsen unless there's action taken. Before we begin, I would also like to say that I am disappointed that we did not receive testimony from the administration prior to the start of this hearing. 
The failure of the administration to come to agreement on the CDC testimony is not only in violation of committee rules and courtesy, it's also a great disservice to my colleagues on this committee who deserve the opportunity to know in advance what a witness's position is, and in this case, the administration's position. Frankly, this is yet another indication of the role of politics that's playing in science. And I hope in this case that the testimony reflects the science and not the politics. Uh, the administration uh, must recognize our role in preventing impacts of climate change on vulnerable communities, including the need to improve health status and health equity, the inclusion of health policy in the development of climate response, and the need to prevent injustices such as those that resulted in Hurricane Katrina. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today, and I really want to thank uh, our chairman, Ed Markey, for agreeing to have this very important hearing. He's been a, a longtime advocate in this area, and finally, we see the day now where these issues that we have been talking about have come to the forefront. So I will yield back the balance of my time, and I will recognize uh, Congressman Blumenauer from Oregon for thank two you, minutes. Thank you, Chair. Well, actually, I may indulge, since it's a little more <laughs> um, relaxed. <Yes. laughs> I may take a couple more in part because, yes. uh, as you, I'm in three places at once right now, for which I apologize, but we've got some Ways and Means stuff going forward. We're missing a caucus, and I don't even know where else I was supposed to be. But I wanted to, to be here to express my appreciation uh, to the committee and staff for bringing us together and for the witnesses to join us. Not everybody is here. We've had a chance, however, to review some of the testimony that did get to us, and we will, the record that is being built, I think, is very, very important uh, to be able to shape and inform what we're going to be doing with climate change. Um, and being able to focus on the human health aspect here, I think, is perhaps um, the most uh, important and underappreciated area. Last week, we had our state uh, epidemiologist, uh, Mel Cohn, give a presentation in Portland where he outlined the public health issues that he's dealing with uh, from climate change, uh, from heat waves, uh, the vector-borne disease, asthma, allergy, air pollution, chronic It was a pretty scary litany of items that, um, that they're con considering with, with um, uh, from changes to physical activity to food insecurity, mental health. Uh, we need to be able to get the big picture together to be able to move forward on this. Um, one particular area that I'm hopeful that the witnesses can help us uh, focus on and supplement uh, the record dealing with the problem of waterborne disease in particular. I mean, this is an area that is an international uh, initiative. It's something uh, we've been working on with my associate, Ms. Benner, since the Johannesburg uh, World Sustainable uh, Development uh, in 2002. We've got the water for the poor legislation, but it's not being funded, and candidly, the administration as yet has not even assembled the plan that was called for under that legislation. And uh, this is only going to be compounded if global warming continues and average global uh, temperatures increase by one, just one degree. Uh, we're talking about a third of a billion cases um, of waterborne illness, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people potentially that would be uh, uh, dying. Um, uh, there are opportunities with our ass assessment of global warming to actually uh, to deal to fight climate change to actually improve human health. Uh, we've got some legislation, uh, Dr. Frumkin, dealing with uh, cycling and land use and transportation that actually uh, not only addresses climate change but actually has the potential of helping the human physical activity and condition and we'll be moving uh, forward with that. One aspect I didn't see, at least as we were reviewing last night, the testimony that had been um, uh, submitted, uh, dealt with climate change's impact on reduced biodiversity and missed opportunities for medical advancements. And I don't know if that's going to find its way into the record now or later. Uh, you know, we've had the testimony, we had that iconic picture of the polar bear, and some people are dismissing, you know, one more species more or less, but just thinking about the amazing capacity of the polar bear to fast for 150 days, maintain a relatively normal body temperature, maintain bone mass, give birth, I mean, just but basically stop 
the other processes. The imp impact that could have for long-term human health is something that uh, I'm hopeful we can get some help from you and from others. I'm going to stick around for as long as I can. I hope to get back. Thank you. I appreciate your leading us through this and look forward to hearing our witnesses. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Blumenauer. Also uh, would like at this time to ask for unanimous, unanimous consent to insert uh, Ed Markey, our chairman, his statement into the record. If there's no objection, then we will do that. Um, next, I'd like to recognize uh, the distinguished member from California, Mr. McNerney, for an opening <laughs> statement. Feel free to take more than two minutes if you would like, but keep it. <laughs> well, I typically am a brief speaker, so I'd probably fall in line. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, and this is a really important part of the question or the issue of global warming is the health effects. Uh, we know there's going to be uh, flooding effects and so on, but uh, the sort of secondary effects I think are going to be actually more important in terms of the effect on uh, our, our people. Uh, we, have, uh, we have to adapt and mitigate. We all know that. Uh, but there's going to be things like uh, problem plants growing that uh, cause more uh, allergies, more um, asthma. Uh, there'll probably be an increased ozone. Uh, the the hot, warmer temperatures, and I'm sure we'll hear about this from the experts, uh, they'll be increasing uh, the rodent population, the insect population, uh, which are vectors for diseases uh, that we probably haven't seen in our society for a long, long time. Uh, there'll be uh, droughts and floods, which have health impacts. Uh, there will be loss of habitat, uh, which Mr. Blumenauer referred to a minute ago. Uh, we will lose tropical rainforests, we will lose coastal areas. So we have a whole range of impacts that are going to be coming down the pike from global warming. Uh, it is important for us right now to understand what those impacts are uh, so that we can begin to plan, we can begin to mitigate, and we can begin to use that as an issue uh, to further the uh, public's awareness and willingness to go along with the steps that we're going to be needing to take to fight these uh, coming issues. And uh, one thing I always like to say is that if we make the right decisions here, we're not only going to be adapting and mitigating, but we're going to be creating opportunities. We're going to be creating a cooperation worldwide. Uh, so I think of it as a great opportunity as well as a threat. So uh, what I want to do is, is listen to your testimony. Hopefully I'll be able to stay through most of it. Uh, and uh, we'll move forward with good legislation as a result. So thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from California. Um, just for sake of, of clarity here, each panelist will, will have a chance to give an opening statement for five minutes, and then from there we'll, we'll go to question and answer. And I apologize if we don't have all of our, our members here. We do have a series of other uh, committee meetings and caucuses that are, that are going on. So our first witness, I'd like to thank Dr. Frumkin for coming here. Uh, just a brief inter introduction, Dr. Howard Frumkin serves as the director of the National Center for Environmental Health and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. He received his MD from the University of Pennsylvania and his master's and doctorate in public health from Harvard. Before joining the CDC in September 2005, he was professor and chair of the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. He previously served as a member of EPA's Ch uh, Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee, where he chaired the Smart Growth and Climate Change Work Groups. He currently serves as on the Institute of Medicine uh, Roundtable on Environmental Health Services, Research and Medicine. He is the lead author on Climate Change, the Public Health Response, which was published in the American Journal of Public Health. This uh, document outlines the CDC's strategy to address climate change impacts on public health in the United States. Dr. Frumpkin, welcome and thank you. And you may begin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and other distinguished members of the committee. I, I am grateful to you for taking up this very important subject. As you said, I'm Howard Frumkin, a director of the National Center for Environmental Health and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm here to speak on our emerging understanding of climate change and its potential impact on health and to discuss steps we're taking as public health officials regarding these potential consequences. I recognize that this topic remains controversial and some of my testimony may not necessarily reflect broad consensus across the administration. In addition, CDC is not a regulatory agency and does not express any opinions on regulatory decisions pending before the Environmental Protection Agency. I'd like to make uh, three simple points. First, climate change is very much a public health concern. Some of the uh, components of that point were very well elucidated by members in their opening statements. 
Uh, potential health impacts include heat waves, uh, respiratory disease exacerbations, severe weather events, infectious disease risks, and others. For some of those, the science base is very well delineated. For others, we have a lot to learn. Collectively, that science base is very well described in documents of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the U.S. Climate Change Science Program, and I won't go into those in any more detail now. The bottom line is that climate change is a very serious public health concern. As the Chair has pointed out uh, on many occasions, it is particularly a concern that affects some of us more than others. Uh, public health is very committed to addressing health disparities, and that commitment very much has to be a part of our, uh, our steps to address climate change as well. The second point is that we need public health action to address the potential health consequences of climate change. Fortunately, the tools of public health, the tools in our toolbox, are very well suited to addressing climate change. Core functions of public health include uh, surveillance and tracking, collecting data on environmental risk factors and on health outcomes, uh, outbreak investigations so that we better understand uh, emerging or re-emerging diseases that may be related to climate change, preparedness planning such as heat wave preparedness plans so that officials at the local level can better protect their populations from some of the consequences of climate change, research because we need to understand much better the health implications of climate change, communication is a core function of public health. That's especially important because this is a broad and complex topic that the public needs to understand well, including its health consequences, and we in public health have considerable experience at communicating a complex health-related topics to the public. All of these and others are core public health functions, and they can very, very readily be deployed as we address climate change. Uh, with the permission of the Chair, I'd like to submit for the record an article entitled Climate Change, the Public Health Response that makes these points in considerably more detail. My third point is that CDC has a strong foundation for the work that we need to do going forward. Now, we have ongoing activity and have for a long time in such functions as vector-borne disease surveillance, uh, heat wave epidemiology, uh, strong working relationships with state and local health departments, uh, preparedness planning, health communication. These are activities that are well established at the CDC and form a strong foundation for moving forward as we address climate change. In closing, let me uh, offer a good news aspect of the challenge that we face. As has been mentioned in the opening statements, many of the steps we need to take to address climate change offer a range of co-benefits that will benefit public health as well as environmental and other uh, areas in diverse ways. For example, if people walk and bicycle more, not only is that part of the climate change response, but it helps to promote physical activity, it helps us achieve clean air, it helps reduce the risk of car crashes, thereby offering a broad range of health benefits. We think there are many opportunities to benefit health in diverse ways as we address climate change. Part of our job at the CDC and in public health more generally is to document the science base for those co-benefits to bring them to the attention of the public and policymakers so that together we can protect health as well as we possibly can as we move forward in addressing climate change. Thank you again for your interest in this subject and your commitment. I'm pleased to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Jonathan Patz. And Dr. Jonathan Patz is a professor and director of global environmental health at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He co-chaired the health expert panel of the United States National Assessment on Climate Change and was a convening lead author of the United Nations and World Bank Millennium Ecosystem Asse Assessment. For the past 14 years, he has been a lead author for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Dr. Patz is president of the International Association for Ecology and Health and has written over 75 peer-reviewed papers and a textbook addressing the health effects of global environmental change. He has served on several scientific committees of the National Academy of Sciences and currently serves on the science advisory boards of both the CDC and EPA. At the EPA, he also serves on a committee investigating the health impacts of climate change on children. Welcome, Dr. Patz, and congratulations. <laughs> thank you, um, and it's really uh, an honor. I want to thank you for allowing me to uh, pr uh, present to this committee and uh, for a topic that I have worked on for about 15 years. Uh, as you mentioned, I did serve as co-chair for the U.S. National Assessment on Climate Change Health Expert Panel and on the IPCC. And from your introductory comments, 
uh, it's quite clear that you understand that public health really is a core impact area of uh, climate change. Uh, and that, uh, in my view, as a public health scientist, the health effects of climate change could be really one of the greatest challenges that we face this, in this century. Uh, the reason is that climate change uh, is a unique and different type of health risk compared to others that we've dealt with in the past. Uh, we've, we're used to dealing with single, agent, uh, single agents of disease and trying to find a cure or a vaccine to toxic chemicals and trying to figure out ways to reduce exposure. Uh, but climate change uh, can potentially affect our health through multiple pathways. Uh, certainly, we know about direct effects from heat waves. Uh, when more than 700 people died in the 1995 Chicago heat wave, and a new paper out just this year um, puts the number, as far as the European heat wave of 2003, up at uh, approximately 70,000 people dying in less than two weeks period. So we know that heat waves kill people. And the projections from the climatologists are that we're going to be having more frequent and more extreme heat waves. Um, we have in, in our center prelim, preliminary findings, uh, at least for Wisconsin, uh, showing that there'll be a disproportionate increase in extreme heat, day, uh, heat waves compared to a decline in cold, cold snaps. So, so we're worried about this. Uh, Dr. J Jacobson will uh, go further into, the, uh, into detail looking at uh, air pollution effects of climate change. I'll just point out that uh, accompanying heat waves are often uh, stagnant air masses that exacerbate um, air pollution. And according to the IPCC uh, citing cl uh, climate uh, studies, uh, there may be an increase in stagnant air masses, at least for the eastern United States. Um, one study uh, that I want to point out that took a look at the relationship between climate and ozone air pollution, that's the ground level photochemical smog pollution, uh, finds that in, in the eastern United States, uh, red ozone alert days, which are dangerous for asthmatics and other people with res respiratory problems, uh, th that could increase by 68 percent. So warmer temperatures drive that chemical reaction that forms ground-level ozone smog pollution, and Dr. Jacobson will cover that further. Another air pollution issue is, is pollen, and, and uh, ragweed pollen, uh, according to one study, will increase by 50 percent uh, under conditions of doubled CO2. So th the issue of uh, both ozone and allergens could be a problem as far as air, air quality. And Representative uh, Blumenauer uh, mentioned, you brought up the concern about water. Uh, our group actually studied the, all, all waterborne disease outbreaks reported in the United States between the years 1948 and 1994. And we found that a majority, actually about 60, well, two-thirds, two-thirds, 67 percent of reported waterborne disease outbreaks were preceded by extremely heavy rainfall months. So we see this issue of extremes of the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle, that climatologists tell us it's not just global warming, it's climate change, it's extremes, you know, more droughts and more flooding, that actually that could present a, a challenge to our already um, challenged uh, water, qua um, water quality and, and in uh, municipalities with um, uh, rusty, rusting pipes and water, uh, water systems, this could be an added pressure. So can we adapt to these challenges? Uh, as Dr. Frumkin said, we, we do have uh, many, uh, we have means to adapt to many of these, these issues. Um, however, I would argue that we need a multi-pronged approach that includes both preparedness and more upstream greenhouse gas mitigation. We do need to address specific issues of heat waves, air quality, water quality problems, but not lose sight of the root problem that's driving this, and that is climate change caused by gr uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
uh, it's uh, in approaching climate change, um, we must also look at this not in isolation of other environmental problems that could act in, uh, in synergy with climate change. For example, a heat wave over a sprawling uh, urban environment with lots of heat retaining surfaces, the urban heat island effect, or when a hurricane hits a, a city like New Orleans and the fact that the coastal wetlands have been degraded makes that area much more vulnerable to a climate event. So we need to look at climate change in, in, um, with other issues. Finally, as uh, Dr. Frumpkin mentioned, there are great opportunities, co-benefits if we reduce fossil fuel burning. Uh, and change our transportation system and, and promote exercise, that's a great thing. And in this regard, I feel that energy policy becomes one and the same as public health policy. And currently, there's very little funding uh, to look at these issues of health, especially the CDC and NIH. There's no, there's no funding uh, to protect the American public, and that needs to change. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, our time is short, but we'll get back with you when we ask our questions. Our next speaker is Dr. George Benjamin. Uh, Dr. George uh, Benjamin has been the executive director for the American Public Health Association, the nation's oldest and largest organization of public health professionals since 2002. This year, the APHA has dedicated National Public Health Week to climate change impacts on health in America. I'm proud to have worked with APHA and, and Chairman Markey to introduce a resolution recognizing this week. We currently have 104 co-sponsors on the resolution. As a, an established administrator and author and orator, Dr. Benjamin started his medical career serving our military at the Madigan Army Medical Center. Later, he moved to Washington, D.C., where he served as chief of emergency medicine at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And after leaving the Army, he directed one of the busiest ambulance services in the nation here in the District of Columbia Fire Department. Prior to joining APHA, he was Chief Executive of the State of Maryland's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, a cabinet-level agency. And we'd like to welcome you, Dr. Benjamin. Thank you, and you have five minutes. Good, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and, and members of the committee. Um, let me, first of all, thank you very much for that resolution. We think that's a very, very important um, statement of, of the engagement of Congress um, in this issue of climate change. Um, you know, each year, the American Public Health Association um, creates policies, um, public policy statements that we think are important for the public's health. Um, and we actually put out our first public policy on climate change back in 1995. Uh, just past November, we reaffirmed that policy. And um, many of the things that are in that policy are very consistent with both uh, your statement, Madam Chair, um, as well as my colleagues, um, things my colleagues here at the, at the table have said. Let me just point out four things, just in the interest of time. Number one, um, the fact that climate change is real and does affect our health, uh, and in, most importantly, that there are certain populations that are more at risk, vulnerable populations. Uh, number two, that we certainly support policies that are co-beneficial, uh, meaning that public health has an opportunity here to um, get two fours and three fours and really leverage public health actions to try to improve the climate as well as the, um, our own human health. Um, number three, that we don't know a lot um, or as much as we need to know about the interrelationship of between climate change and our health, um, and more importantly, what we can do about it. And so there is really a need for an extraordinary research effort to, to find some of those things out. Um, and then four, this requires um, enhancing uh, the public health system with the skills, tools, uh, and capacity to really address this very, very important role. Um, now, this week, during National Public Health Week, what we're trying to do, of course, is to raise consciousness uh, around this issue. Uh, we're asking all Americans to do five things. Number one, uh, be prepared, particularly for these extreme weather events. This is consistent with all the other preparedness activity um, that's occurring for a variety of, of threats to human health. Uh, secondly, to think about travel, traveling differently, um, which means folks like me need to drive less and walk more, bicycle more. Um, do what we can. Um, thirdly, eat differently. Um, find ways in which we can um, certainly eat more locally, um, do things so that both it improves our health uh, as well as um, address the issue of climate change. That means eating more fruits and vegetables and less meat, and that's always a challenge for a guy like me. <laughs> um, greening your work, um, recycling. Um, even at the American Public Health Association, we had an event, we brought someone in yesterday 
uh, to talk to our staff about things that we can do to green our work. We actually have a green team uh, at our office which is trying to lead by example uh, and green your home. All the things that we talk about in terms of insulating your home, uh, changing the bulbs to the compact fluorescent bulbs, um, reducing your use, your use of wasteful products, recycling, et cetera, and conserving water. Uh, these are things that we think all Americans can do, and we're trying to encourage this week uh, for all Americans to focus on this effort. Um, I, I think the, the communication that we're trying to put out uh, is trying to tell the American people that there are things that they can, they can certainly do to address this problem. We also think there are some things certainly that Congress can do. Number one, um, continue to play a leading role in this area. We think that Congress um, and the administration both have an opportunity to play a very important role here. Um, that includes authorizing a program at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, a very specific program to address this issue, including the funding to support that, um, funding the National Institutes of Health, particularly NIEHS, uh, to begin doing some of the basic science research that they do, um, better funding and support for the EPA uh, as well, um, using some of the vehicles that you already have, such as the to-be-debated um, transportation bill, uh, when it comes in front in, before you, the farm bill, which is in front of you, and others. Uh, these are opportunities for you to leverage health uh, into the discussion um, and that way um, build capacity to do some of the things you heard Dr. Patz talk about um, to make this more of a holistic approach to improving um, our environment. Um, and also provide funding um, for health <coughs> impact assessments so that people are continually asking about uh, what is the health impact of the actions that we're going to do uh, as a way of trying to both do adaption and mitigation uh, as we go forward? Um, we think in conclusion that we certainly can't wait. Um, this is a very, very important time uh, in our nation's history. We think we ought to start now. Um, I also, with your permission, like to introduce a couple things for the record, both our, um, um, our white paper on climate change um, as well as um, a blueprint document that we have here. Um, if we could possibly introduce those in the record, and with uh, that, thank I'll you. Uh, with that objection, we'll we'll include that in your testimony. Thank you very much, and Madam Chair. I, I will pass the rest of my time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Benjamin. It's a pleasure working with you. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Dana Best. She represents the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is a nonprofit professional organization of 60,000 primary care pediatricians pediatric medical uh, subspecialists and pediatric surgical specialists dedicated to health, safety, and the well-being of infants, children, adolescents, and young adults. Dr. Best is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the George Washington University School of Medicine and an attending physician at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. She serves also on the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Environmental Health, and in October 2007, the committee published their report, Global Climate Change and Children's Health. Thank you, Dr. Best, for being here, and you can begin your, your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning to all of you. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to testify today on the impact of climate change on ch child health, and I'm proud to represent the American Academy of Pediatrics in this regard. Human health is affected by the physical environment. As the climate changes, environmental hazards will change and often increase, and children are likely to suffer disproportionately from these changes. Anticipated health threats from climate change include extreme weather events and weather disasters, increases in infectious disease and air pollution. Within all of these categories, children have increased vulnerability compared to other groups. The health consequences associated with extreme weather events include death, injury, infectious disease, and post-traumatic mental health and behavior problems. Experiences with hurricanes Katrina and Rita demonstrated the difficulties with tracking children's whereabouts, keeping children and caregivers together, and the special needs of hospitalized infants and children during and after major national disaster, natural disasters. Vector-borne infections are affected by climate change as well. Both the hosts, for example, rodents, insects, and snails, and the pathogens, such as bacteria, viruses, and parasites, are sensitive to climactic variables such as temperature, humidity, and rainfall. For example, malaria is a climate-sensitive vector-borne illness to which children are particularly vulnerable. Because they lack uh, 
uh, because they have naive immunity, children experience disproportionately high levels of both sickness and death from malaria. Climate change is expanding the range of mosquitoes to higher altitudes and latitudes, and warmer temperatures speed the development of the parasite within the mosquito itself. Small children will be most affected by the expansion of the malarial zones and the success or failure of our response to those changes. Children are especially vulnerable to both short-term illness and long-term damage from air pollution. Children's lungs are developing and growing. They breathe faster than adults, and they spend more time outdoors in vigorous uh, physical activity. Formation of ozone, in particular, is known to increase with increasing temperatures. Children who are active in outdoor sports in communities with high ozone are in, at increased risk of develop, developing asthma, which has been well documented. Rates of preterm birth, low birth weight, and infant mortality are increased in communities with high levels of particulate air pollution. Some investigators have argued that part of the global increase in childhood asthma but can be explained by increased exposure to allergens in the air driven by climate change. Those are allergens like pollen, as previously mentioned. For all organisms, there exists a range of ideal temperatures above and below which sickness and death increase. Humans are no exception. As temperatures increase, the frequency of heat waves increase. Children spend more time outside, often playing sports in the heat of the afternoon, which puts them at increased risk of heat uh, stroke and heat exhaustion. Outdoor time during hot weather may also put children at increased risk of ultraviolet radiation-related skin damage, including skin cancer. Food availability may be affected as land and ocean food productivity patterns shift. Water availability may change and be reduced in some regions. Populations on the coasts may be forced to move because of rises in sea level, and massive migrations are conceivable driven by abrupt climate change, natural disaster, or political instability caused by increased demands for shrinking resources. World population is expected to grow by 50% to 9 billion people by 2050, which would place additional stress on ec ecosystems and increased demand for energy, fresh water, and food. As these changes evolve, social and political institutions will need to respond with aggressive mitigation and adaptation strategies to preserve and protect public health, particularly for children. In addition to its recommendations to pediatricians for reducing their own energy demands and incorporating sustainable practices into their personal and professional lives, the American Academy of Pediatrics calls upon government of, at all levels, from the smallest munici muni municipalities to the national and international levels, to implement aggressive policies to halt contributions to climate change caused by humans and mitigate their impact on, on children's health. First, policymakers should develop aggressive, long-term policies to reduce the major contributing factors to global climate change. For example, the Environmental Protection Agency should set the National Ambient Air Quality Standard for ozone at 0 0.060 parts per million. Our government should invest in prudent and vital preparations for our public health care systems, including immunization programs and disease surveillance reporting and tracking. And that means they have to be funded too. Policymakers should give specific attention to the needs of children in emergency management and disaster response. Government should support education and public awareness of the threats from climate change and their implications for public and children's health now and in the future. Government should fund interdisciplinary research to develop, implement, and measure outcomes of innovative strategies to both mitigate and adapt to climate change, particularly those effects that ha have direct implications for children's health. In order that members may have access to the full information on this topic that we have prepared, I'd like to ask that our statement, the American Academy of Pediatrics Policy Statement and Technical Report, both called Climate Change and Children's Health, be included in the hearing record. In conclusion, the American Academy of Pediatrics commends you, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman, for holding this hearing today to call attention to the potential impacts of global climate change on children's health. We look forward to working with Congress to prevent the ad adverse impacts on child health caused by global climate change and plan for those we may be unable to avert. I appreciate this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you. And without objection, we'll uh, receive your additional report information. Our next uh, speaker and our last speaker is Dr. Mark uh, Jacobson. Dr. Mark Jacobson is Director of the Atmosphere and Energy Program and Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Stanford University. 
He has been at the forefront of developing models to better understand the effects of air pollutants on climate and air quality. In 2000, he discovered the black carbon, the main component of soot, may be the second leading cause of global warming after carbon dioxide. In 2001, he developed the first global through urban scale air pollution weather climate model. His latest publication is titled On the Casual Link Between Carbon Dioxide and Air Pollution Mortality. Dr. Jacobson, welcome and thank you for coming and you have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to uh, thank the committee for inviting me to testify today. I will discuss scientific findings on the effects of carbon dioxide emitted during fossil fuel combustion on air pollution health in California relative to the United States as a whole. I will then discuss how these findings compare with the two main assumptions made by Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Stephen L. Johnson that formed the basis of his decision to deny California's request for a waiver of Clean Air Act preemption. Um, on March 6, 2008, uh, EPA Administrator Johnson published a summary of his decision to deny the California Air Resources Board request for a waiver. The decision was made on two grounds. Uh, first, green, in quote, greenhouse gas emissions uh, from California cars are not a causal factor for local ozone levels any more than greenhouse gas emissions from other sources of of greenhouse gas emissions in the world, he says. And second, while I find that the conditions related to global climate change in California are substantial, they are not sufficiently different from the conditions in the nation as a whole to justify separate state standards. Uh, these identified impacts are found to affect other parts of the United States, and therefore, these effects are not sufficiently different compared to the nation as a whole, uh, end of quote. Uh, these two issues are questions of scientific fact, which I will address here with results from a published study I performed, funded in part by the EPA, and subsequent analysis. Uh, the study began about two years ago, bef before the waiver issue became an issue, and before EPA funding commenced on the project. It was also the, uh, the culmination of research on the effects of climate change on air pollution that I started eight years ago, and of research on the causes and effects of air pollution that I started 18 years ago. I first examined the effects of temperature alone and separately uh, water vapor alone on ozone using an exact solution to a set of several hundred chemical equations uh, in isolation. The figure on the screen now uh, shows the resulting ozone at low and high pollution levels. A comparison of the solid line base temperature with the dashed line, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 degree Kelvin higher temperature in the figure shows that the increase in temperature increases ozone when ozone is already high at all water vapor levels, but has little or no effect on ozone when ozone is low. The figure also shows that water vapor, the horizontal axis, independently increases ozone when ozone is high, but can slightly decrease ozone when ozone is low. This re result implies immediately that higher water vapor, sorry, higher temperatures and water vapor uh, should increase ozone where it is already high. It is also known that California has six of the 10 most polluted cities in the United States with respect to ozone, including Los Angeles, Visalia, uh, Bakersfield, Fresno, Merced, and Sacramento. So it is expected from this result alone that a warmer planet should increase ozone pollution in California more than in the U.S. as a whole. The next step was to evaluate whether carbon dioxide could trigger the temperature and water vapor changes sufficient to affect ozone when many other processes are considered simultaneously and to evaluate effects in California. For this, a three-dimensional global model of the atmosphere that focused at high resolution over the United States was used. Uh, the next figure next set of figures show differences in temperature, water vapor, and ozone over the United States due solely to historically emitted fossil fuel carbon dioxide from the simulations. Carbon dioxide increased near surface temperatures and water vapor and both fed back to increase near surface ozone, the last figure shown, as expected from the previous analysis. Carbon dioxide similarly increased particles in populated areas for several reasons described in the written testimony. The changes in ozone particles and carcinogens were combined with population and health effects data to estimate that carbon dioxide increased the annual U.S. air pollution death rate by about 1,000 uh, per 1 degree 0.8 degree Fahrenheit or 1 degree Kelvin, with about 40% of these uh, deaths increased deaths due to ozone. These annual additional deaths are occurring today as historic temperatures are about 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit or 0.85 Kelvin higher than in pre-industrial times. Of the additional deaths, more than 30% occurred in California, which has only 12% of the U.S. population. As such, the death rate per capita in California was over 2.5 times the national average death rate per capita due to carbon dioxide-induced air pollution. 
A simple extrapolation from U.S. to world population gives about 21,600, there's an error bar, uh, deaths per year worldwide per one degree Kelvin or 1.8 degree Fahrenheit uh, due to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide increased carcinogens as well, but the increase was relatively small. Next, let's examine the effect of controlling California's carbon dioxide as if it's local emissions instantaneously mixed globally, which it does not. In such a case, controlling local carbon dioxide in California still reduces the air pollution related death and illness rate in California at a rate 2.5 times greater per capita than it reduces the death rate in the U.S. as a whole. However, carbon dioxide emissions do not immediately mix globally. Instead, carbon dioxide levels in polluted cities are much higher than in the global average, as shown with data in the figure now on the screen. Although, th and this is from Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, although the global background carbon dioxide is currently about 385 parts per million, the data indicate that a medium-sized city's downtown area can have an average of 420 to 440 parts per million of carbon dioxide and a peak over 500 parts per million carbon dioxide. The, the figure now on the screen, so almost done here, uh, show computer simulations in carbon dioxide in, of carbon dioxide effects in California for a month of August due solely to local carbon dioxide emissions. The elevated carbon dioxide over the urban areas is consistent with the expectations from the data. The increases in local carbon dioxide led to increases in water vapor and ozone over California. Since carbon dioxide emissions outside of the grid shown were not perturbed for the simulations, the simulations demonstrate that the effects on ozone found here were due solely to locally emitted carbon dioxide. In sum, locally emitted carbon dioxide is a fundamental causal factor of air pollution in California. The final slide here demonstrates, uh, compares modeled and measured parameters over uh, each hour of a month and demonstrates the ability of the computer model used here to simulate the weather at specific times and locations. In conclusion, uh, this analysis finds the following. Global, uh, a, global warming due specifically to carbon dioxide currently increases the air pollution related death rate of people in California more than it increases the death rate of people in the United States as a whole relative to the respective population. The reason is that higher temperatures and water vapor due to carbon dioxide increase pollution the most where it is already high and California has six of the ten most polluted cities in the U.S. The deaths are currently occurring and will increase in the future. B, controlling carbon dioxide from California will reduce the air pollution related death rate and illness rate in California 2.5 times faster than it will do reduce the death rate in, of the U.S. as a whole. And finally, carbon dioxide levels in cities are higher than in the global atmosphere. Such elevated levels of CO2 were found to increase ozone in California as such locally emitted carbon dioxide is a causal factor in increasing air pollution. These results contradict the main assumptions made by Mr. Johnson in his stated decision, namely there is no difference in the impact of globally emitted carbon dioxide in California versus the U.S. health and locally emitted carbon dioxide does not affect California's air pollution any more than carbon dioxide emitted anywhere else in the world. I am unaware of any scientific publication that supports either assumption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now begin uh, questioning, and I'll begin with uh, myself for a uh, five-minute round of questioning. Um, Dr. Jacobson, thank you very much for being here. Uh, according to your presentation, uh, you're, you are stating uh, or underscoring that there, there is a, a correlation between uh, urban cities and the, uh, the high incidence of uh, omittance carbon dioxide and the negative effects it has in uh, different cities in California. Now, Los Angeles is very different from, say, Bakersfield or the Central Valley. Can you just touch on that, what uh, some of those, uh, you know, how that is occurring, what that process is there? Okay, in terms of carbon dioxide, well, a lot of the pollution in the Central Valley is due to particulate matter air pollution, uh, as well as ozone, and in Los Angeles, it's also due to particulate matter and ozone, but sometimes different times of the year. Um, the carbon dioxide is emitted more, there's more carbon dioxide emitted in Los Angeles, so the CO2 levels in Los Angeles will be higher. However, the Central Valley does receive, emit its own and also receives a lot of carbon dioxide from uh, the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area as well as coming from the south uh, from Los Angeles. And there are going to be, uh, the Central Valley is more spread out, so you expect the ozone changes in particular will be over a larger area but it has a slightly lower, pop lower population in concentration, in terms of its concentration compared to Los Angeles. Uh, the pollution in Los Angeles will be affected the most. I mean, the health impacts will be greater, expected to be greater in Los Angeles because you have such a high population and the levels of ozone are generally higher 
in Los Angeles than in the Central Valley. And the pollution will get worse where the pollution is already bad. What will happen <laughs> if we take no action? Uh, well, right now, the historic, historically, we, temperatures have already risen due to carbon dioxide. And this is currently causing about, I would say, estimate medium value of about 800 additional deaths per year uh, compared to the background of about 50,000 deaths per year due to air pollution. The background air pollution death rate in the U.S. is 50 to 100,000. And in the, per one degree Celsius or 1.8 Fahrenheit increase in temperatures, that's about a, estimated as about 1,000 additional deaths with a range of 350 to 1,800 per year. So far, we've res the temperatures have already risen about 80% of this. And so deaths are already occurring. In the future, they're expected to occur more. So the problem is already here, and the deaths are already occurring. Do you agree with the uh, decision that EPA made? Do you uh, have any comment on that? Um, no, I, do, I disagree with the decision for the reasons I cited in my testimony that there's no basis in science that we know of right now for the two main reasons that were cited by Administrator Johnson. I mean, those were assumptions that he made that the two assumptions he made were that uh, first CO2 just mixes globally, that uh, there's no differential effect on health in California versus the U.S. as a whole, and there's no effect of local carbon dioxide on air pollution in California. Those assumptions were just those assumptions. They weren't based on any science that I'm aware of. Were you aware of, if there were any scientific evidence that was put out uh, prior, prior to what your research told you? Was there any uh, information uh, from EPA that you may have seen? No, I'm sure there... I'm sure there have been no studies because the study I did, which was published on February 12th, uh, 2008, is the first study to look at the effects of uh, temp carbon dioxide specifically on uh, air pollution, ozone, and particulate matter, and carcinogens in the United States as a whole and on public health. There have been no previous public studies at all. All right. Thank you. Uh, my next question is... Uh, for Dr. Frumkin, and I apologize if I can't get to everyone because you all had very good testimony, and I want to I want to thank you for that. Um, but Dr. Frumkin, we've heard from your colleagues that uh, there seems to be a need to increase funding in the area of uh, global climate change and, and its relationship to health and children, and uh, the need to kind of fast forward funding so that we can be prepared. Uh, in your opinion. Uh, what, are, what can we do to help uh, provide more support for your particular uh, office? We're doing what we can now uh, in terms of public health preparedness and prevention uh, with respect to climate change. We have uh, technical assistance underway. We have research programs in a very small way underway. We have, uh, we're building the science base and so on. We recognize the possibility of doing more. Uh, Further public health activities would involve further research. We need to build our science base considerably. Uh, public uh, technical assistance to state and local health departments would need to increase. Is your, is your budget adequately funded to provide for these, for these kinds of research um, developments that we need to undertake? As I said, we're doing uh, everything we can within existing resources now. Uh, we do recognize the possibility and the opportunity of doing more. Could you, so you could use more uh, financial support? funding for research, preparedness, yes or no? With further resources, we would be able to do more. Okay, very good. I think my time is up, um, but uh, certainly we'll come back and ask another round of questions so we can get to, to more of you. Um, I want at this time uh, recognize our, our next uh, colleague here who has five minutes for questioning, and that is the Congressman, uh, Mr. Weldon from Oregon. So. Thank you. Thank you, for Thank you Madam us. Chair, and I appreciate uh, the witnesses and your testimony. And I've uh, you know, been on this select committee duration of this Congress, and I think uh, you all provided some really superior testimony, especially compared to some we've we've had. I appreciate the the uh, detail you've offered, um, Dr. Jacobson. I'm I'm curious. Uh, Aren't there already communities in California that have not met the, uh, the clean air standards under federal law today that are out of attainment? Yes, that's correct. And what effect does that have on public health? Have you uh, that, studied that? Well, that's, that's pretty well known to be a, a serious effect on public health. So I mentioned there are about 50,000 to 100,000 people die each year in the United States due to air pollution, and a good portion die in California, prematurely that is, uh, right. due to air pollution. And that's due to existing uh, health problems due to mostly fossil fuel combustion. Yeah. 
Okay. And have you studied uh, what the health outcomes would be if, if California just met the existing clean air requirements um, and got those cities into attainment status? I can't say I, I can give you this. I haven't studied that specifically in terms of get, can provide numbers for it. But I should point out that even if the if California were in attainment, there would still be premature deaths because sure. with 0.08 parts per million standard, 80, or eight, that's uh, still way above the health threshold for ozone uh, ozone pollution health effects, which is about 0.035 parts per million or 35 parts per billion. So the standard is 80 parts per billion, and the health effect threshold is 35 parts per billion. So anything, even if you met the standard, you'd still have health problems. What what's level are the, those uh, cities at now that are not in attainment? Uh, uh, Los Angeles can get up to 150, I think, in the right now. I mean, it used to, in the 1950s, it would get up to 560 parts per billion, wow. but that doesn't happen anymore. In the so 150 for LA? Right now, parts yeah, per parts per billion, per billion in ozone, and well, I think it may even some days it gets up to 200 parts per billion, which is a stage one smog alert. But it might just be below and the, that. And the federal uh, limit is supposed to be 80. Well, that's for eight hour. The uh, the one hour standard is 120 parts per billion. So these high levels are generally for a shorter period of time. So they might just be exceeding the one hour standard rather than the the eight hour standard. Okay. Um, I, I wonder, it, it, as we look at the balance, how how long would it take to get temperatures in the globe to actually come down? If uh, I mean, I, that depends on what all we may or may not do here. But I look at uh, Europe; they've got a cap and trade system, and yet their carbon dioxide emissions actually went up 1.1 percent last year, even with their framework right. in place. Trying to figure out, I, I've read some data that indicated it'd be at least 50 to 100 years before you'd see a trend line go the other direction. Is that what you're finding in your data? With carbon dioxide, the lifetime of carbon dioxide, which is the time it decreases to about 38 percent its original value, is about 35 to 50 years. And so you can imagine for over 35 years, you're going to get, um, you'll start to get, see some feedback. You'll get down to uh, you know, you get a reduction of two thirds, almost not quite two thirds, sixty percent. Um, however, there are other com chemicals that cause, like black carbon, for example, which is from so uh, the main component of soot, which right. has a much shorter lifetime of a few weeks. So, if you control that, you can actually get the feedbacks within one to four or five years. And so, if you control soot, that's kind of the fastest way to slow global warming. Controlling methane is probably that has a fast, uh, faster feedback than carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is one of the longer lived greenhouse gases, not the longest. So what could we do that would control soot most effectively? Uh, well, aside, I mean, the shortest term is diesel particle filters and off-road vehicles, construction equipment, farming equipment. Um, but the next step is really to convert all those diesel to clean electric type vehicles eventually, or uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles powered by clean renewables. So yeah. I, I, I'm understand that in, in Europe, they've always used more diesel yes. in their vehicles than we do, which is part of why they get higher mileage. But they've also uh, subsequently uh, uh, ended up with more f premature deaths because of the added pollution in the air. Is that because of the soot? Uh, correct. That's one of the reasons. Their death rate, while the U.S. has 50 to 100,000, Europe is maybe 300 to 350,000 per year. And a lot of that's due to the fact that they have, like, it's like 40, 50 percent of their cars are diesels putting out particles. Uh, so there is a lot more particle pollution uh, in Europe, and particles are the main component of air pollution health problems. Right, one yeah. final question for, for each of you, perhaps, if, if there's time. My understanding is that under some of the cap and trade provisions like the, the Warner Lieberman bill, I, I've talked to some power companies that rely a lot on coal for production of electricity, and they indicate that their cost of power would go from 4.8 percent to 11.5 percent or, or more than double. When we think about health issues, I think about heating for elderly in the winter and cooling in the summer in the hotter climates. Have any of you studied the effects of increased energy prices on um, health care, especially among either the young or the elderly? 
if you more than doubled the electricity costs in the country. 52% of our power comes from coal, if that's what the model shows when you run it through, that it's a, a two and a half times increase in electricity. I'm wondering, have we looked at that too as we look long range? Dr. Franklin, or, or I'm sorry, Frumkin. We haven't looked at that question at the CDC, but I'd be happy to look for information on that and pass would, it back to you. you that, yes, sir. That would be helpful. Dr. Benjamin, anything from? Yes, sir. No, no, we haven't, um, although um, if we're simply looking at costs, I think that the, the, the thing we want to put in the equation is the cost of, of health care, um, which would offset um, some of the, just the dollars. Yeah, I want to look at all the costs and the effects, because I know we, we hear anecdotally when there's a huge heat wave, the number of people that die in their homes because they don't have adequate air conditioning. And then when it's really cold, we hear about those who freeze and are bundled. You see the pictures on television every winter of people bundled up, especially seniors. So I'm just trying to figure out all of these input costs and, we, and we certainly would, the we would love We would love to look at the health care costs with you, and, and yeah. not just the death, but, but the people that actually get sick. Sure. Uh, Dr. Bass or, or Dr. Uh, the impact of these extreme temperatures on are very real for children. In terms of costs, that's not a calculation that the Academy um, has a, a, a stand on, nor do we do research, but we do know that there are groups who have done this, and we'll be happy to That'd report on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Um, I, I work with uh, energy policy experts uh, in our center, and um, a couple of points that they, they have uh, told me is that the, the competitive price of renewables is coming way down. Wind power is becoming competitive. Uh, but more, moreover, I, I would like to point out to historically the arguments against the Clean Air Act where uh, the argument was this is way too expensive. It's going to cost our economy. It's going to hurt us. Um, and the, there was major concern. And when, once the Clean Air Act was implemented, uh, there were some analysis conducted that found that by far the benefits, especially health benefits uh, and environmental benefits, but especially health benefits, uh, made the, the action of the Clean Air Act much, uh, you know, much favorable. That, in fact, That's the concern great. of the cost was unwarranted. So you don't think there's any concern with a perhaps two and a half fold increase in the cost of electricity produced from coal, that that won't have any health effect or any effect on the economy? Well, I think that is a great research question. Um, right. I think that the, the argument about economy versus environmental protection is a false argument. I, I'm not making and that argument. I'm trying to find is, out. Time uh, is way over, oh, and I thank right. you. But if we'll have another round of questioning. I'm going to excuse myself. I have to go vote in another subcommittee, and I'm going to turn the gavel over to Congressman Ensley uh, for his five-minute uh, uh, questioning. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jacobson, uh, I think, has been too modest here. He's, he's actually the uh, author of a paper called A Renewable Energy Solution to Global Warming, which talks about the electrification of our transportation system, and it's a cause of significant optimism. I'll share that with Mr. Walden. He might find it of interest. I'd love to see it. I, I will do that. Do you want to make any comments about that at all, Dr. Jacobson? Um, sure, I'm happy to. <laughs> um, so we've looked at uh, what's the possibility of converting the entire uh, vehicle fleet in the United States to electric vehicles uh, powered by renewable energy, primarily wind, but solar combination actually a wind, solar, geothermal, hydroelectric, tidal wave power. And well, in one an one analysis, we focused primarily on wind and looked at well, how many wind turbines would would need to power the entire vehicle fleet. And it turned out to be with if you use five megawatt, which are large turbines, they're currently existing in Europe. They're not in the United States right now, but they they're manufactured or by a company. Uh, if you put them in locations where the wind speed is between seven and a half and eight and a half meters per second on the annual average, then it turns out you'd need between 70,000 and 120,000 five megawatt wind turbines to, to power the entire US vehicle fleet with electric vehicles. And part of this is because electric vehicles are so efficient uh, compared to internal combustion, they're about five, four to five times more efficient. So you need less energy basically to run them. Uh, but there's plenty of wind to actually do this. Well, by the way, this number, 70 to 120,000, there's, you know, it's less than the 300,000 airplanes we produced in World War II over a period of seven years, and most of those in the last three years. And the winter, then the space you need for this is not that great. It turns out, well, just for the turbine spacing, you need to separate them by a certain distance so they don't interfere with each other. Uh, but it's 
for this, it's about 0.5% 0 .5 of the United States. In it could be a lot of it offshore. Uh, but that compares to if you wanted to do the same thing with ethanol fuel vehicles, you need about 15% uh, of the entire United States, which is 30 times more land area, or even cellulosic ethanol would be 20 times more land area for that than doing it with wind. And the actual land area you need for the turbine spacing touching the ground is really only two square kilometers, because so you can use for all these turbines, because they're just poles in the ground, you can use all the land underneath for farming and ranching and open space. And a lot of this could also go offshore, which is so it doesn't actually have to go over land. Doctor, I've got to, got to make sure I got another question. Oh, yeah. I was really heartened by your research because it confirms sort of what I believed. And there's a couple of books that talk about that theory out there. One's called The Earth, The Sequel, just hit the book stands. Another called Apollo's Fire. Uh, and they both are optimistic visions, and I appreciate your research on that. And I'll try to share it with my colleagues. Uh, Dr. Frumkin, the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Massachusetts versus EPA required the EPA to determine whether greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, can be reasonably anticipated to endanger public health and welfare, despite uh, apparently EPA staff's finding that it did. The administrator refused to sign off on that endangerment decision. I just want to ask you, based on your considerable expertise in public health, uh, do you believe that greenhouse gas emissions cause or contribute to air pollution, which may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health? Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I recognize that there are legal and regulatory dimensions of that question. Uh, CDC doesn't have a position on, on those issues, and uh, nor does it have a position on uh, any of EPA's regulatory decisions. Uh, what I can do is speak to the public health science. Uh, the, the science is clear that carbon dioxide uh, does contribute to climate change. And uh, as I and others have testified here today, climate change does pose a number of public health challenges. I kind of take that as a yes, that it does have the capacity to endanger public health. Is that, you know, is that a fair statement? I think I'd let my words speak for themselves. <laughs> I think we got the message I wish the White House did. Um, um, I wanted to read a quote, actually, uh, which was one of the, if you believe in irony, this is one of the great ironies, in turning down California's request uh, for regulation of greenhouse gases. The administrator of the EPA said, quote, severe heat waves are projected to intensify in magnitude and duration over the portions of the United States where these events already occur with likely increases in mortality and morbidity, especially among elderly, young, and frail. Ranges of vector-borne and tick-borne diseases in New North America may expand but with modulation by public health measures and other factors. Would anyone disagree with the position that if you conclude that, you by necessity have concluded that, that carbon dioxide has the capacity or capability to endanger public health? Does anybody disagree with that in this panel? No, sir. If you were going to reach that, I'll take that, that no one disagrees with that. Next question is, public health experts, we have been struggling with how we get America to move on global warming. You have seen the federal government largely acting in the last seven years um, under this administration much more as the ostrich with the head in the stand and the tail feathers in the air rather than the American eagle, and we need to change that. As public health experts, can you help us on what you think the best messaging is to the American people on trying to uh, tackle this beast? How do we, you know, you've been successful in seat belts and changing behavior, but you've had some success in and tobacco usage, what, what messaging works to help move America in this direction? Um, Mr. Ensley, I, I think, um, at least from the American public health perspective, we need to change the message from um, the end of the world, there's nothing we can do, till this is a very significant problem, and every one of us can do something in an incremental way that would make a big difference. Um, I think that what often happens with big problems like this, uh, people um, get overwhelmed. And so from our perspective, uh, simply telling people again, you know, travel differently, do some things differently at home, do some things differently at work, um, and letting them know that every little bit helps will make a big difference. Dr. Pats? Yeah, if, if I could just add, um, I think that the, the 
issue of co-benefits, that in fact uh, this could be a great opportunity if we think about uh, <coughs> changing some of our energy policies, especially in the area of transportation. Uh, Sixty percent of Americans do not meet the minimum recommended level of exercise, and this is one where we've, we've sort of designed unhealthy cities, and this is a great opportunity when we think about greening cities, reducing greenhouse gases and, and automobile <coughs> traffic. We have a great opportunity to enhance personal fitness. Another point that I think uh, is both locally, as Dr. Uh, Jacobson pointed out, regarding CO2 emissions affecting California, but also th that, in fact, our CO2 emissions do affect the world. And just like the argument of secondhand tobacco smoke, where what one individual does and lights up a cigarette th and that smoke affects someone else, uh, this is actually a, a global problem as well, and that our energy emissions are, uh, in fact, um, hurting other countries, not only our own. So I think that's a, a message as far as uh, an ethical issue. I appreciate it. Dr. Frumkin, did you want to add something? Yes, sir. Just to let you know that uh, CDC has been holding a series of expert workshops on various aspects of climate change. The most recent one was on uh, health communication regarding climate change, precisely because we recognize the question that you just posed, that public health communication has been very successful in many domains. What can we learn from that to apply to climate change communication? We know, for example, that bad or threatening news is difficult for people to take, but if it's coupled with constructive recommendations about what you can do, it's much easier for people to accept that news. Well, some of us believe, and I appreciate Dr. Menjian's comments, that we need to, to switch from doom and gloom to a sense of the can-do, innovative, optimistic spirit of America. That is an American message. I believe it will succeed here. I will now hear five minutes from uh, Representative Cleaver. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, I apologize for being late like everybody else. We're all running between uh, several hearings, uh, but I didn't want to, want to miss this uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, and the primary reason is the panel. Uh, those of you here uh, offer, I, I think, the nation a, a great perspective on this issue. And uh, I, uh, I grew up in a, uh, an all-black neighborhood in Texas, and we were only a few yards away from the uh, waste treatment well, actually, it didn't. It, it did not get the sophisticated name of waste treatment plant until a few years ago. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I um, also realized that the incidence of uh, some diseases, uh, most particularly uh, asthma, uh, is highest among. Uh, African-Americans, and uh, when you look at where the waste treatment plant was and also where the city dump was located, uh, you see that that's about a 99.9 percent African-American community. And um, I, I note that the, uh, Dr. Uh, Batch, you, you, uh, you use your uh, t term uh, disproportional uh, vulnerability. I think uh, that uh, that caught my attention uh, earlier, and uh, is the the climate change uh, and environment uh, uh, placing uh, uh, at risk uh, the poorest people, uh, the people of color who live in, in areas where we've chosen, with with some great intentionality, to to locate these uh, these facilities that emit. Uh, I think, uh, at least at, at at the least, unpleasant um, odors and and maybe even uh, some other particles that would be damaging. Yeah, this is a, a, a very good point regarding the different portions of the population that would be most vulnerable to climate change, and what we're dealing with when we talk about climate change are extremes in environmental conditions, be it a heat wave, a flood, a drought, uh, or severe storm. Uh, certainly, we know that uh, it is the, uh, the poor uh, that are most at risk in heat waves, especially the poor uh, elderly. Um, as far as flooding, you know, people that live in floodplains would be more at risk, and when you deal with uh, 
uh, ozone pollution. Uh, it is true that uh, African Americans do have a higher rate of asthma. Um, so there are um, certainly, when you, you know, when you look at Hurricane Katrina, uh, which, uh, you know, simply was a, you know, we don't know, well, I won't make any judgments about why it occurred. Uh, uh, but when Hurricane Katrina hit, it really was the, uh, the, the poor and mostly African Americans in New Orleans that simply did not have the means uh, or the ability to, to get out of town. Uh, and avoid that disaster. So I think uh, to the extent in this country, absolutely there are populations uh, uh, at risk that are primarily the poor. And uh, if you look globally, it's the same situation. Compare sea level rise in Holland versus Bangladesh, and you can see that a population with very little um, abil capability to re react uh, is at more risk. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Benjamin, uh, do, uh, would you, would you say that there are, are, um, are things in, in landfills uh, that uh, could be, that could become airborne that would do damage, um, medical damage to people who live nearby? Absolutely. absolutely. Um, obviously, there are lots of things dumped in landfills that are toxic. Um, if you really look at, there are probably four broad areas um, that disproportionately affect vulnerable communities, particularly minorities. One, um, more vulnerable to extreme weather events, um, much more lower baseline health status, um, and then you place people um, in near toxic environments like that, um, and then they, as a community, the community capacity to recover is diminished. So all four of those things, including the toxic issues that you're concerned about, are, are measures that need to be paid attention to. I, um, I've, I've gone down to New Orleans twice. We've held hearings down there. Uh, the flood was one issue and that, that was terrible and devastating. I had a son down there in college um, at the time of the flood. The, uh, the, the issue that I'm concerned about more now than the flood is when we went down there, we all had to wear masks when we went into the, the Ninth Ward. There is a, a, I grew up in public housing. There's a stench down in New Orleans like nothing I have ever experienced in my life. And, and, I, and of course, the, the landfill uh, was washed into the Ninth Ward. Uh, and I, I, my fear is that we don't know the damage of Katrina right now, that it may not come uh, uh, into uh, fruition for a few years down the road. But I cannot imagine that, that uh, we are not going to have some uh, prolonged uh, damage to lungs and, 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 and probably much more uh, in the years to come. Do any of you have any comments on it? My time has expired, but do, do any of you have any comments? I, I, I second your concern, and I also want to emphasize that it's children who are having, reaping the permanent harms from these exposures, and because they have a longer shelf life, they will reap, they will suffer those harms for longer periods of time than an adult who was exposed in the same event. So we need to consider children especially when we think about these kinds of disasters and um, environmental harm. Thank you very much. Um, we can go for another round of questioning if you'd like, and I certainly would like to ask more questions, but I w would like to go back to Dr. Frumkin and, and just uh, a basic question here. Do you believe that greenhouse gases do have an impact on health, an adverse effect on health, on public health? I, that was a question we addressed while you were out of the room, uh, Madam Chair. The, uh, what I mentioned was that that is a complex question with regulatory and legal dimensions, and CDC doesn't have a position on the regulatory and legal dimensions of that question. Uh, as for the science, uh, there is strong evidence that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that contributes to climate change, and there is strong evidence that climate change threatens health in a number of ways. Have any studies in your department that you have been involved in indicate that? I'm sorry, indicate that? Uh, any, that there is a correlation, and in fact, this is evident. One example of research that we've done would be looking at uh, heat waves and, and characterizing the epidemiology of heat waves, identifying who's most vulnerable and how the deaths and, and uh, illnesses occur from heat waves. 
uh, heat waves are expected to become more common with climate change. So that is a yes. <laughs> okay, you had mentioned something earlier as well in your, in your opening statement, in, uh, in your testimony, alluding to differing views within the administration. Uh, and I wanted to ask you if you could kind of at least give me an idea what that means, uh, what the difference is between your agency, OMB, and the administration. What differing views were you talking about? I, what I was referring to was that uh, I, we have a considerable amount of uh, work going on on climate change at the CDC. Uh, it is extensive. Uh, it's, it's well represented on our website and in our <coughs> publications. But I don't know that uh, all of that work has been carefully vetted across the administration, so it, it isn't necessarily the case that all of our work uh, has, uh, that represents a consensus across the administration. But they are given all that information from you, these, the, the OMB and the administration? Uh, I don't know and can't speak to the level of attention that, that all of our work has had. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brumstein. I wanted to ask Dr. Bess, you talked extensively about children and public health prevention and preparedness, and you mentioned um, that we should really have more of a, an organized method here of, of preparing uh, children for these negative health effects that, that are going on. Can you be specific and give me some idea of what we could do that currently isn't in existence that could help us prepare for that? Well, it's, we've talked in, in broad generalizations about some of the issues today. Um, a, a, a good public health um, infrastructure that is supported and funded appropriately is, um, is key. Um, in terms of uh, children's health, we also need uh, health insurance for children. We need to make sure that children have access to health care um, through appropriate placement of workforce. We also need to think about children when we think about um, cost-benefit um, uh, calculations, the costs of an immediate, um, you know, the, the costs incurred by uh, improving the quality of our air are not just borne by the industry that pollutes the air, they're also borne by the children throughout their lives. Have you seen any differences? We talked a little bit about disparities that exist between communities of color mm -hmm. and the general population. Are you, are you seeing any of that uh, with respect to how uh, negative health uh, I see it every day. I, with my, respect to air pollution as Yes, yes ma'am. And um, can you elaborate? I, I serve the, the, um, the low-income minority population of Washington, D.C. every day in my clinical practice. Those are the children that I care for, and they suffer um, asthma, um, adverse um, permanent harms to their lung function because of um, the air pollution effects in the city. Um, and they have um, poor access to care because of the fact that Washington, D.C. is an, yet another example of an urban island where children aren't treated as well. Right. Okay. Dr. Patz, you want to try and yeah. I, I would just like to make a comment about um, you know, about the research and um, what is available, what is out there, what do we know, and what do we need to do. Um, you know, Dr. Frunkman mentioned that the, the CDC is doing everything that it can because they understand how climate change is a very important public health issue. Uh, I've been doing climate change health research for about 14 years, and have received some grants from the EPA, NOAA. Uh, these, are, these are not large programs. Uh, to date, I really don't think there's been much funding at, the, at CDC for preventing uh, some of the health effects of climate change. There's an intention. They understand the problem. They're he holding workshops. They want to do something, but I don't see funding uh, at the CDC. I think their hands are tied when it really comes to serious uh, protection of the American public from the health effects of climate change. Likewise, NIH uh, has really not been uh, funding climate change health research. They're now talking. There are actually some meetings next week, and hopefully they'll, they'll have some mandate to actually uh, allocate funding to public health research. But uh, I, I think that uh, we really, I, there's, you know, I've been applying for these grants and seeing these. 
the CDC really has, has uh, hardly any funding to support their efforts to protect us from climate change, and I think that's a huge, uh, a huge need. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jacobson, I I'm, uh, want to thank you for your testimony, first of all, and just tell you that the area that I represent in California is one of the hev heavier polluted communities. Uh, we have freeways that just transverse across uh, our, our communities there. And I've often wondered also, as my colleague, uh, Mr. Cleaver, asked about uh, ambient air pollution uh, and the, the cause and effect for our children, uh, as was mentioned earlier, having so much activity outside and not being properly, or the, or the folks that should be, the gatekeepers should be somehow helping to try to, try to pr provide more information in terms of safety for our children. Um, can you maybe touch on that? But I assume it's Los Angeles? Yes, okay. Los Angeles, East yeah. Los Angeles. Okay. Um, yeah, living near a freeway is a dangerous place to live because you have particles coming right from the tailpipe and they're, that's when their concentrations are the highest. The particle, particles, by the way, are the most damaging component of air pollution health and there's no threshold to the health problems due to particles. You can go down almost zero and you get health problems due to particles. So, and vehicles are emitting particles even though they're a lot, the emissions are much lower than they used to be. Uh, they're still emitting it, these particles, and they're, they're pretty concentrated as they go downwind of the freeway, even like 100 meters, 500 meters, you know, even a kilometer down, you know, they, they'll get diluted, but the concentrations are going to be highest near the freeway. And these particles, these are the ones emitted. Now, that doesn't mean other people aren't affected downwind. So there is this, this local air pollution right near the freeway, but then there are other types of particles that form in the atmosphere due to chemical reactions involving the sun and gases and converting gases to particles. And there are also gases that evolve ozone doesn't, isn't emitted from a tailpipe, it's formed in the atmosphere. So actually downwind in Los Angeles, and particularly in the east side of Los Angeles, because most of the emissions are on the west side, although there are a lot on the east side, but most of them are on the west side, and these emissions get transformed and, and moved by the, by the wind to the east side where there are concentrations of the chemicals formed in the atmosphere build up the most. So people far downwind actually also have a big, uh, are affected by the air pollution significantly. So there is this local effect where people near freeways have, a, have bad health so effects. So it's compounded. Yeah, it's, com well, it's not, a, well, I would say that if you're on the west side, you're not getting so much of the secondary pollution. Right. You're getting more of the primary pollution. Right. If you're on the east side, you get more of the secondary pollution. So where it's- lower income people tend to be living or working. Near the freeways probably. So yeah, so you're getting more of the, the primary pollution, but all populations are getting the secondary pollution really depending on, because it just spreads out all over Los Angeles. Right. And just a last comment on, yeah. on soot. Yeah. <laughs> something that um, you didn't mention was marine vessels. Yes. And that's something that we're looking into. Have you done any research on, on that? Um, I, yeah, includes uh, marine vessels and aircraft uh, in terms of their, uh, because their aircraft is another pretty unregulated right. uh, source of soot emissions. Right. And marine vessels are, I guess, I'm not sure what the status of the regulation is, but they're pretty much unregulated on the global scale. And that's an area where you can get, um, especially in ports. I mean, mm -hmm. when you're out to sea, there's going to be some impact, but it's not going to affect the health as much as right near ports if, if marine vessels are idling. I think in California there have been some recent laws to have them plug right. in, not be, but that's, so that kind of stuff is a really good idea. Okay, my time is up, so we'll go uh, next to Mr. Weldon for questioning. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, appreciate that. Um, Dr. Jacobson, I'm gonna go back on this issue of wind turbines. Uh, I represent a 70,000 square mile district in Eastern Oregon, okay. uh, home for the Northwest, probably to some of the most wind turbines uh, in the area with many more coming up online. And I know that it works well there because of the uh, dams uh, that allow us to have hydro power. There are some, even some on this committee would like to tear out some of those dams and I don't know what the replacement power is, but it's gonna have a bigger carbon footprint than hydro. But because the wind isn't firm energy, um, that becomes a, a bit of a problem. And I know the Bonneville Power Administration has told me there's a capacity to how much wind they can actually put on the grid. Have, do, are you aware of studies that can give us some ideas regionally where we can put the wind? My understanding is in the Dakotas, actually, there's much more wind potential than other places. Uh, have you looked at those infrastructure issues? Um, yeah, so two points. Uh, one, we did, we did produce a world wind map 
And it's actually the only map of the world's winds at uh, 80 meters, which is the height of modern turbines. Right. And that's publicly available. I'm happy to send it to you. Uh, second, we have looked at combining different renewables together to firm the capacity. Right. And having th the West Coast is really well suited for this because it has a lot of hydro. Right. And the hydro is, r is excellent for, for, yeah, dealing with the intermittency and filling in gaps because you can turn it on and off within 15, 20 seconds in spinning reserve mode. So it's, but you can actually combine also solar because a lot of right. places wind peaks at night and solar peaks during the day. So you can even combine wind and solar and balance load better there and use the hydro to put in, fill in the, all the gaps from that. So we did a study for California. It was, it was kind of a rough study, so it's, we're doing some more detailed study now. But we found in for 2020, if we actually looked hour by hour, that we could, if you combine these renewables together, solar, wind, uh, hydroelectric, geothermal, um, that's the ones we looked at, you can get an exactly smooth output of supply without anything else. Wow. And so it is, but that, I mean, that was in California, and I, yeah. I would assume it's the same in Oregon, too, in Washington. Yeah, I, I would think so. The uh, yeah. Geo Heat Center at, at Oregon Institute of Technology in Klamath Falls, they, they've mm -hmm. spent a lot of time looking at geothermal potential and have told me that there's enough in Oregon to produce two-thirds of our electricity needs yeah. with geothermal because of these new advances in the last year and a half and being able to produce electricity at a lower, well, it's the delta between the cold water and the hot, but right. at lower, and we've got a 10 meg geothermal plant just uh, sited in my district. And so the, the key that we will have out west is we have the potential. A lot of it rests on federal land, and there are a few on this committee or on the committees in charge in this Congress today who will allow us to access um, those resources. And it seems to me if we're serious about dealing with some of these energy issues, you have to be able to cite the wind where it's needed, where, where it can produce. The, the wind turbines within boundaries, I understand. And we're starting to get pushback on that visual impact. We, you mentioned offshore. We know in Massachusetts they didn't want it where they could see it. Nobody wants any of this stuff where they can see it, by the way. Um, and, and in terms of geothermal, I think we're going to face some challenges just accessing it. Are you, uh, have you looked at that? Um, well, yeah, well, geothermal is a base load, so it mm -hmm. doesn't really have the intermittency issues. Um, it's great. Yeah, it's a great base load. I haven't looked at that in a lot of detail, but it's a, it's a good source. In terms of siting the wind turbines, uh, keep in mind that the, uh, the total area, if you really want to solve this problem, is pretty, it's not a large amount of area you need. Right. So the question is, do you want to look at the wind turbines or would you rather look at a coal-fired power plant? I mean, right. it's not really a qu nobody wants to add anything. It's really a question of what you're replacing. Right. And so if you have a coal-fired power plant that's you know, emitting stuff that's hurting your children downwind, that, you know, you'd I think people would rather look at the wind turbine. There are about, I think it's like 20 or 25 offshore wind proposals in the United States right, right now. So the only one you ever hear about is the one in Massachusetts. But in fact, all the other ones, they don't have the same problem. Good. In terms of, well, I don't, I'm not saying they don't have problems but in terms of actually getting implemented, but they don't have as much public uh, uh, controversy as in that, is that one. Well, I'm, I'm real interested too in the, in the notion of plug-in hybrids. I bought a, a Prius last July and double more than double my gas mileage here in Washington. And last month, I bought a Ford Escape Hybrid and getting 66% better mileage than the SUV I used to have. I'd love to be able to charge it up at night uh, yeah. on the grid, um, but you can't do that yet. In terms of battery development and domestic investment, we've done that in the various energy bills. We put money out there to, to invest in new technology for battery life. What are you seeing uh, from the scientific side of things? How far away are we from, from really making a leap forward on battery? Well, Tesla rolled out their first uh, right. electric, pure electric vehicle on lithium ion bat laptop batteries, and so they're they're starting to produce them. So they exist now. They're I mean, very small number. I mean, I think they've put out one, one of them is actually on right. the road now, and I think they're another. But it's coming. <laughs> yeah, but the, so they do exist, and there are many electric vehicle companies uh, following in the, in the wings. And I, I, from what Tesla says, you know, these batteries will last a while. I mean, I have a Prius myself. I got it in 2001 or two, and I haven't had to change the battery. And that's not with these lithium ion batteries. That's with a little older right. version. So they last pretty long, uh, at least these older ones even last pretty long from my, from my own personal experience. And the lithium ions, from what they say, should also last quite a while as well. So I don't, I don't know a lot about the details of the battery industry, but I, I 
can say that it's, I'm pretty optimistic about it, but that's the idea is to plug in your own home. Right. Uh, you have maybe solar panels on your roof. You have smart meters that control when you get the electricity, so that's another way to smooth out the supply of intermittent right. renewable energy. And that's in California, PG&E is doing that. They're developing smart meters to, so that they can control when you get your power your, if you plug in your car at night. So it's really a combination of all these renewables with a smart electric grid and actually organizing the grid in such a way in the United States so that uh, we can not only have, we know where the wind farms should go, but we have the transmission between them. Because exactly. that's really the limiting factor in the it expansion is. of wind is transmission. And we need an organized transmission grid. And, and also that reduces the intermittency too. If you connect two wind farms that are far apart enough, then, then you smooth out the supply too. So there's a, a benefit, a financial Thank and a you, Dr. wind Richardson. benefit. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Thank you. That Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. Uh, Appreciate it. Our time there. Now I'd like to recognize our Mr. Cleaver for another round of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, could, could I ask if, if people leave the, the, the room uh, and risk intellectual damage by not hearing everything that goes on here, if you would uh, hold the door when you go out, uh, it, it's, it's creating uh, sound pollution. Um, the question that I would like each of you to answer uh, is we, 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 we know the, the issues of challenge uh, starting with you, Mr. Jacobson, what, what would you do if you were a member of Congress uh, in terms of legislation that would uh, have the, the greatest impact in reducing the health risk of, of uh, American public, particularly as children, uh, as a result of climate change? Um, I would do two things. One is relates to providing better renewable energy sources. And the other relates to, um, if we go back to what the issue I was discussing, which is the waiver issue, being able to allow states to actually control their emissions. And then that also is the same, th effectively the same thing, which allows them to uh, try to find ways to reduce their carbon in cars by a low fuel standard or some more renewable energy. But more specifically, um, having an, a national program, as I mentioned, for expanding renewable energy in, I mean, a large scale, because the, if you look at the state, individual state uh, portfolio standards, they're, you know, they have reduction, they have expansion of renewable to 20%, let's say, of their total electricity, but that's not enough. You need an 80% reduction in carbon to address climate change. So you need a huge infrastructure change that's much larger than anybody's proposing at state levels. And so to do this, you really need this kind of uh, national kind of Apollo-like program to go to true renewables, which are wind, solar, geothermal, hydroelectric, tidal wave power. And then, but in order for that to work, you need a big, better transmission system to interconnect these. So having kind of an organized transmission system with a large scale uh, renewable energy program uh, would make a lot of these problems go away because especially if you start using battery electric vehicles instead of the you know, fossil fuel vehicles, then you make a lot of these air pollution problems go away automatically by better, with better technology. Um, but in the meantime, allowing states like California to uh, control their own, own CO2 has a similar effect because other states then follow. California has been an example for 50 years, basically, since 1948 when the Los Angeles Air Pollution Control District was started in uh, making regulations. And, and it's, it's actually the very first Motor Vehicle Control Act in the world was a California 1959 Motor Vehicle Control Act from California. Uh, so you really need to have states uh, control their uh, pollution and also to expand renewable energy. Thank you. I, I'm going to ask if you, uh, each of you would do a, a short response because my time is running out. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacobson. Well, Dr. Jacobson spoke to energy and transportation policy. I'm going to speak to public health actions that we need to take. These are the standard public health uh, protection steps. We need uh, surveillance and tracking, uh, good data collection so that we have a sense of where we are both on environmental risk factors and on health. We need public health preparedness planning so that states and localities can forecast the problems that they may face and take steps to protect the public. We need research so that we better understand the health implications of climate change. We need good communication so that people understand the issue and the steps they can take. All of those are the standard tools in the public health toolbox. And the steps, what, what we can do to promote those actions uh, would go a long way toward helping us protect public health. 
Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Let me concur with my, um, my former colleagues and what they said, particularly the comments of Dr. Frumkin about the, um, investing more in the public health infrastructure. Um, let me uh, talk about two very specific things as well. One, um, I would like to see a program actually officially authorized within the Center for Disease Control and Prevention uh, around climate change, um, and obviously uh, to fund it as well. Um, secondly, um, really paying a lot of attention to policy. Um, there are a lot of things that often aren't thought of as, uh, as health policy. Again, farm, the farm bill, the transportation bill, um, a lot, lots of things that we do around the built environment that have huge health implications. Uh, and for Congress to think about um, health impact assessments um, in all of those pieces of legislation. And, and obviously, we would be eager to help you as you think through that. Thank you. And I would Thank second all of my colleagues' comments. Um, I, I would also urge a long-term um, force uh, perspective rather than short-term immediate gain. When we think about children, we th again, we think about how long they are going to be on the earth, and we need to think about how a, an exposure or an, a, an, a catastrophe that they, in, they uh, experience during childhood affects the rest of their lives. We also need to think in the micro level as well and, and think about how we as individuals can uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, and think about how we as employees and co-workers co and uh, patients in hospitals, how we can make sure that those principles are part of our daily life. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think that uh, climate change can influence so many different um, risks to health that, that have been uh, outlined throughout the hearing. I think very important to Congress is to understand the integrating nature of the health, health risks of climate change. So that will demand a concerted effort across uh, both the public and private sector uh, addressing climate change uh, policy should include aspects of health preparedness, as Dr. Frumpkin has mentioned and uh, Dr. George's, has, uh, George's Benjamin has mentioned that we need to have specific targeted funding for CDC to address climate change. Urban planning is part of this issue. Natural resource utilization as far as uh, vulnerab actual vulnerability to a population when experiencing extreme climate. So natural resources and energy policy, that energy policy and public policy really should be linked. So it, it's a truly uh, new type of challenge, and it's going to demand serious uh, legislative measures, uh, unlike uh, I, many other of the health effects that we've studied in the past. I think this is truly one of the most uh, you know, serious, broad-reaching issues that cannot just be put in a box and focus in isolation. Climate change touches on so many of these other areas that ultimately affect uh, the health of uh, our population. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very much. Um, I wanted to uh, personally thank all of you for coming and providing us with your testimony and for speaking before the Select Committee. It, it means a great deal to us that are working on this issue, and especially this topic for some of us is, is just so important. It is a priority for many of us. Um, and as a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee that I sit on and, and Health Subcommittee, this is something that um, I have been longing to see more discussion about. So we, we don't just have to have it in this select committee, but it should be in other committees of, of similar jurisdiction. But I, I want to just say, um, make one comment, and then I will, I will go to each of you and ask you to give me a one-minute uh, kind of wrap-up of what we should take away uh, from your discussion today. Uh, and one is, for me right now, um, I'm, I'm often uh, confounded that we're not able to get the research data that, that uh, indicates that we're having adverse effects, chronic illnesses, and how that then is contiguous with uh, many of the environmental, the, the particulate matter, the smog, the ozone, and where that is easily accessible for the public. It's great that we have the science and the research, but if it's not correlated or brought together in some format, the public and the, the voting public is not fully aware of what those implications are. We see it manifested years out, especially with children and our elderly when we talk about asthma, just as one example. But that is something that, um, that I know that I have been frustrated over for a number of years, given 
the proximity of where I live in a part of Southern California where the ozone, smog, uh, water contaminants, many, many adverse uh, contaminants that are affecting our population that will have an impact for years to come. And we don't have a good thermometer or gauge on what we should be doing to turn that around. So anyway, that's my one cent <laughs> for what it's worth. And then I will go to Dr. Potts and give you each a minute to kind of give, give us something here on the committee that we can take away that we should be thinking about. So, so we really, um, you know, the, we do understand that climate change does pose these risks uh, and we need to be prepared. Uh, we do need more research. We do need to understand uh, the nature of these risks more. We are beginning to make some headway as, as far as looking at place-based, you know, location-based uh, problems. Um, and I think that that's where, uh, you know, where climate will actually have an impact is where uh, we can really look at one place and look at the vulnerability based on its natural resources or be it Los Angeles, the basin, and, and there have been studies showing that uh, heat waves may even triple uh, in, in California. So these types of, of uh, analysis. But I also think that um, we've, we've uh, brought in this issue of health impact assessment, which is more than just looking at adverse risks that we're used to studying, but to look at both the negative effects and potential positive effects from changes in policy. And this is where I think we really need to get a better handle of, uh, that will get a better quantification of the true story when you, when you change policy and you reduce greenhouse gases, for example, in an urban population, you know, the multiple co-benefits to air pollution reduction, increased fitness, and reduced greenhouse gases, it's got to be a comprehensive type analysis to really get an understanding of, of uh, assessing, um, uh, assessing uh, that policy intervention for climate change. As a pediatrician, um, and as you know, I'm here to represent children, um, I would urge you to consider children and children's health every time you make a decision. Because um, what's good for children is good for the rest of us. It's good for the environment. It's good for um, our education system. It's good for business. We need to remember that children are here for longer than I am, or will at least their potential life is longer than mine. Um, and that um, everything we do that improves the climate, that improves our education system, that improves our healthcare system has, an, has a many-fold impact on their lives. And those, that includes public health infrastructure as well. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Benjamin. Let me just state um, uncategorically that climate change is here and it has health effects. Number two, um, we can and should address it now. And number three, let me just focus very specifically on the area of vulnerable populations because I know others will talk about the broader public health issues. That one, we need to begin looking at very specifically uh, the science around how this affects these vulnerable populations. Um, number two, um, trying to engage them now in the conversation. And I use the word conversation very specifically so that we don't just talk to people and talk at people. We actually engage in a, a two-way dialogue. Uh, and number three, engage them now in, so that we can begin to craft solutions that make sense for their world. Um, their world is different um, than the world that I may live in, um, the world that you may live in, um, depending on socioeconomic status, et cetera. Um, or other capacities, and we need to very specifically engage them in their world for solutions. Thank you. Dr. Frumkin. Uh, Representative Solis, thank you very much, and thank your colleagues as well on this committee for shining a spotlight on this very important problem. Uh, climate change is a major public health challenge. There's a lot we in the public health sector can do to tackle it. Uh, the conventional terms mitigation and adaptation correspond to what we in public health call prevention and preparedness, and those are standard public health efforts. We need better research so we understand the science better. We need preparedness planning so that we can take steps to protect public health. We need to communicate effectively the things we learn and the recommendations we develop. As we do all of that, we need to focus on the most vulnerable among us. Uh, poor communities, communities of color, those with particular vulnerabilities so that we can take special steps to be sure those communities are protected. We at CDC stand ready to work with other agencies, with uh, state and local public health, with uh, 
uh, organizations across the health sector and with partners in transportation, energy, and other sectors so that we can do the very best we can to protect public health. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. Uh, well, I think we, thank you very much for inviting me again. Uh, I think we know that climate change is going to increase, and it does currently increase air pollution the most, where the pollution is already the highest, and right now the pollution is highest in California, and so that would give a reason for uh, California to be able to control its own air pollution. But if we look broad, more broadly at what are some solutions to climate change, then there are these large-scale renewable energy solutions that are feasible uh, in terms of the resources available if we just put our mind to it, and I think it really requires kind of a focus on that issue. And part of the problem I've seen, the reason there hasn't been more of a focus on renewable energy solutions is that a lot of the, not only the funding, but also the, uh, just the talk is really on solutions that are really less beneficial from a climate or air pollution point of view. And I sp speak specifically of, for example, biofuels, which there is really no demonstration that, that it actually improves climate or air pollution. Um, there's this carbon sequestration, there's you know clean coal, other, other technologies and uh, that have been pushed by industries, which the science hasn't shown that these are actually proven benefits. So I think there's a good fo a change of focus. Right, thank you so much. That will conclude our hearing and I wanna thank the members that came uh, this uh, morning and also our witnesses and to the audience. Um, hopefully this will be the first in a series of discussions we'll have on the environment, uh, climate change, and, and health care. So thank you very much. Thank you. This meeting's adjourned.